Welcome to SDA Mastery, the podcast series hosted by Tanya Gomez Consulting. In each episode, we'll be sharing valuable insights and tips that can help you learn the intricacies of specialist disability accommodation. We will demystify the entire SDA process, give you direct access to experts in the field, and help you to discover what life is like as an SDA provider. Whether you're thinking about leaping into SDA or you're looking to level up your existing NDIS business, you're in the right place. Come on in. Let's explore the SDA space together. Um, So welcome, Perry, to SDA Mastery, and thank you for joining me today. Um, Today, I wanted to talk to you about the day in the life of an SDA provider and I guess about your journey through SDA. Okay. Um, Look, firstly, thanks for having me. I'm a bit excited about being here. I've heard a bit about your podcast. Thank you. Um, A day in the life of an SDA provider. Uh, Oh, goodness. Look, we're all learning as we go along a little bit. Um, It's a relatively new thing, particularly here in Western Australia. I think we are a little bit better placed than some because we have a very extensive history in property management. And um, that's rather critical, I think, understanding that side of it. Uh, before you actually move into that um, SDA, NDIS housing side, that's probably just property management with a lot more complexity. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about GRA um, and how you ended up in the NDIS space? For whatever reason, Tanya, we've always been operating in very niche areas in property anyway from our inception. Um, Our business model has always been in the investment side of it. We've had exposure to the National Rental Affordability Scheme area as well, which was a very niche area. As a business, we were very heavily exposed in the global financial crisis, and that was quite damaging for us. Um, And it was really looking for what is the next um, niche area that we might identify. And um, this NDIS phrase kept on popping up everywhere. So it was more a case, probably around 2018, I first became aware of it. Let's have a closer look at this. And then by 2020, we were registered and operating. Yeah, wonderful. And can you explain to me in layman's terms, what does SDA mean? Um, SDA is very simply specialised disability accommodation. So it's a, it's a it's a type of accommodation that runs to a very high level of compliance standard to allow people with disability to reside and really achieve their goals and and not be disadvantaged, I suppose, in in just achieving a normal lifestyle. Mm, Wonderful. Um, And what are the types of functions an SDA provider does? We as a business focus on the end goal. And and for us, that is making sure that a property is going to be occupied. Um, So it's really an end-to-end model for us. It is around design compliance and a a level of specification that will mitigate at the back end um, our capital partners who join with us um, suffering too much vacancy. Yeah. Um, so that's, I suppose, the best way I can explain it. And I'll probably take it one step further. People who are looking at this, if they haven't got a leasing solution in place for the end, shouldn't really start. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Um, and can you tell me about how many houses, uh, SDA sites or homes or uh, that you have currently across WA, uh, what your pipeline looks like? Sure. Operating right now, we have... Uh, 78 bed. We have two vacant beds at the moment um, in that portfolio. They're in an apartment complex. Outside of that, the pipeline has a further 143, 143 homes and 270 apartments. Wow, quite a lot. It is quite a lot. Yeah, um, We're finding that apart from what um, we have set up with our established networks and relationships now, we're starting to attract other organisations who probably didn't start out with the end in mind, who are now looking for a leasing solution. Yeah, yeah So right. they're starting to identify us now. And we've talked about what SDA is. What's your definition of what an SDA provider is? Is it this property management and leasing piece? To a certain degree. There is also a lot more um, eyes on the business, though, in terms of who's going into the property, who's looking after the people in the property. What we're finding is there's a extremely higher attention on communication between all the parties, yeah. much more so than what we ever 
had experience before in conventional property management. It is the communication, how you actually communicate, uh, making sure it's understood. And we, we do talk about this a little bit within the business, how since we've been in this area of property management, it's an area that's very rewarding. It's really good for the soul. Um, and for the first time in our history, we're sitting in the middle of a, of a relationship model where everyone likes us. Previously in conventional um, property management, we sit in the middle of a relationship where everyone is really finding reasons not to like us. Well, it sounds like you've definitely found your sweet spot then. Yeah, we, we all do enjoy it. It's very, very busy though. So you mentioned, you know, the people taking care of the participants, people like care providers or SIL providers. How do you involve the, the SIL providers or care providers in the journey as an SDA provider? Good question. There's a whole range of skill levels across that sector. Uh, you've got your very well-established not-for-profit type organisations who have a very um, defined and structured model that they probably are going to stick with for a little bit longer, but springing up like mushrooms all over the place are these um, new SIL providers. And what we're trying to encourage these people to do and these organisations to do when we meet them is really understand your business, yeah. have a much better knowledge of um, running the business itself before you worry too much about looking after the care because the people you're giving the care to um, are expecting you to be able to be around to deliver the care. And if yeah. you're not, what is going to be the outcome for these people? Have you seen SIL providers falling over because they're not well managed? Not yet, no, not, not yet. yet. We're, we're quite selective around who we will work with. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're meeting a SIL provider for the very first time, it's more an application process from them and it's quite detailed. Um, some don't want to participate in it, but we want to see balance sheets and we want to see their business strength as well as their experience and so forth before we will actually engage with them. Yeah, so you're trying to control your risk. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, dead right. Well, our risk is really risk that transfers to our capital partners as well. What do you look for in a SIL provider outside of a healthy balance sheet and experience running a business? There's a number of things. Uh, you do get to some people up very, very quickly and personality and characteristics are a big part of that as well. You. Something I learned from my father-in-law, you don't get a second chance at first impressions. Yeah. And, and that weighs very heavily in, in decision-making for myself anyway. Yeah. Uh, we do have a new person in our business now who fortunately uh, knows and understands most of the people in the sector pretty well because she was involved with um, an organisation that dealt with paying all the invoices through the plan management side of things. So that brings to our business a whole lot more depth of knowledge around who's who in the in the school and what they're up to and um, who we should and shouldn't be working with. Yeah, okay, great. And a question that I get asked quite frequently that seems to be the success, potentially one of the success factors in, in SDA is really around choosing the right location. How do you determine the right location to build your SDA properties in? There's a number of different ideas around this, but um, first and foremost, it's where the people are. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the simplest fundamental. But that location then could also be subject to um, a lot of competition. The way you look to try and mitigate that from our perspective anyway is to have a far superior product. A two resident plus on-site overnight accommodation property with a 255 square metre floor plan is going to outperform a three resident property with a 220 square metre floor plan. And it's just the level of spec and um, finish and size and... Um, homeliness that you bring into the property. Outside of that, um, infill locations obviously um, do perform a lot better. We've identified that suburbs that would have at least a 40-year life in them already probably now have an evolved population that um, does carry a fair bit of NDIS participation. So these would naturally be better areas than greenfield peripheral suburbs. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. In your opinion, what is the secret to being a great SDA provider? Um, I don't know yet. We've got the right name anyway. So uh, look, time will tell, but we think we're going okay. It is very much a learning experience. In the interest of transparency, I suppose, we actually have just finished a, uh, a sit-down meeting with the Quality and Safeguards Commission around a specific complaint issue. And uh, it did get to a mediation from that experience alone that we, we there's nothing fundamentally wrong with what we did in this particular scenario other than the level of understanding from the other side um, probably wasn't as good as it could have been. And, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis too. Um, that's the only complaint we've had to deal with today. But what makes a great one? 
longevity, I suppose, is a really good point. And very few have any at the moment, do they? Well, it's a brand new sector. Yeah, it's exactly. hard, hard to have longevity. It's a very immature escape. Yeah, dead right. So time will tell. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay. In your opinion, what is the difference in the responsibilities between the SIL provider and the SDA provider? So there's a very simple demarcation line, in my opinion, um, and we define this in our handover pack as well that we um, enter into a new home with. So when we're going into a new home, here is your handover pack. It very clearly defines our expectations on where that line is. Just to give you an example, you know, a property requires a, an emergency evacuation plan. Mm -hmm. um, the people within the property require personal emergency evacuation plans. And um, that is not our domain. Our domain is to deliver the evacuation plan and it's the SIL provider's domain to actually organise within the house how they're going to apply the individuals in the house to actually meet that evacuation plan. So mm -hmm. I would say it's our job to provide the accommodation, make sure the accommodation is fit for purpose all the time, make sure it's up to standard all the time, repair repair breakdowns, um, bring in home modifications as and when they're needed, if they can be funded. But thereafter, it, the people that live in the house, it's the responsibility of the SIL provider to make sure that everything else there is working. So they're fed, they're cared, they're clothed, they're washed, mm -hmm. they have a peep, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yep. Wonderful. What advice would you give to someone considering being an SDA provider for the first time? Um, if you haven't got property management experience, go and get some. That would be the best advice I could give anybody. It's not something you can step into blindly. You need to be a registered or licensed real estate agent in the territory that you're operating in anyway. It's not something that you should be engaged in if you're not already in that sector. Great advice. Thank you so much for joining me today, Perry, to talk all about SDA. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of SDA Mastery by Tanya Gomez Consulting. We hope you found this episode helpful and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave us a rating and share it with others. Until next time, keep learning.